Hey there, friendly. This is up. Welcome to the 17th of November episode of the Beer Blades and Butchcraft live stream. And um, I got beer. I got blades. And we're going to talk about bushcraft. And in fact, tonight we're going to talk about blades. Uh, what I want to talk about and hopefully hear you guys' opinions about is... Um, Who's your favorite mic knife maker? <laughs> I'm going to try that again. Who's your favorite knife maker um, and why? Uh, what feature or other element makes, in your opinion, a terrific bush knife and why? Uh, and, you know, I want to talk a little bit about maybe your favorite knife or my favorite knife um, and why? I'm just going to say hi to everyone else who's uh, who's coming in. Uh, wood pigeon. Let's see. Wood pigeon, wood pigeon, wood pigeon. It's a neck knife I made. Just need to put a handle on it. It's a mini Canadian jump knife style. That sounds interesting. That sounds very interesting. Um, yeah, Mark, I, um, I think we'll talk about that in a big way. Um, and in fact, that brings something up because I don't have the Groman, right? My Canadian belt knife is the uh, the cold steel, um, but I would dearly, dearly love the Groman number one. Um, you know, are, is there a knife that you have that you have tried or just have seen pictures of or whatever and you really, really love? And why? Why is that? Um, so I, I will just tell you a little bit about what I'm, you know, about what I'm throwing down, and then uh, and then I'll probably just open up the floor immediately. Um, Tyler Rodriguez is here. He's probably got all kinds of interesting things to say. Now, granted, Tyler also makes knives on the occasion. Um, so if you want to talk about your own stuff, uh, you could just be prepared that someone may want you to build them something. So I don't know. Uh, but I would love to know, Tyler, what you think about... Like, what's your favorite knife that you didn't make? Um, so, yeah, uh, Colin's here. Uh, Grace says, I don't have enough experience with knives to really have any favorites, but I do have a Garberg. You don't have enough experience and you've got a Garberg? I thought you just jumped the whole training wheels thing. Because um, I also have a Garberg. Uh, and the reason I... I bought this because I had to know what all the hype was about. <laughs> Excuse me. I had to know what all the hype was about, uh, especially because I was like a hundred bucks for a Mora. Give me a break. But this is definitely my favorite Mora. It's, it's all about the, um, the full tang, you know? Um, Oh, Hey, Hey Dauber. How's it going? You've probably got some interesting stuff to say as well. Um, uh, Hey, Pi Martin's here. Pi Martin loves the Mora. I, I know that about you. Uh, your tastes are very uh, very practical. Uh, I think you've you've got a bunch of Moras, don't you? Or you've got a, several. Uh, um, but yeah, I, I've got a whole bunch of Moras as well. I like to keep Moras sort of as a backup knife in case everything goes wrong with my main knife. And I'm at the point now where I've got like three main knives that I just sort of cycle through over the course of a season. You know, when I'm actually going out to the woods. I know, outdoor dauber. You can't baton with this. But I may have to and put it on YouTube again just to see who the hell tries to take me down for it again. Um, Grace says, the first knife I bought was a Gerber, and it's worthless. Well, maybe you could open letters with it. Um, I have a, a Gerber LMF2, which is like a you know, military cut yourself out of a burning helicopter kind of knife. Um, it's very robust, except that the, uh, the, the pommel is, has come loose. So I'm like, mm, okay. Uh, Colin is about to get a neck knife from a friend, Doran. That sounds interesting. Oh, Martin, you've got three more. I thought you had like more like four or five. I don't know why I thought that. It was just like, because we, we haven't really spoken about knives, you know. I, 
I do want to, excuse me. I do want to clarify something for everyone here. I'm not really a knife guy. I'm an ax guy. Um, I have more knives than I thought I would have. And there are others that I would really like. Let me tell you, but I, I'm not a, a knife collector. And, and I'm not into knives the way um, I have a neighbor who, who essentially he collects knives, right? He he'll drop 1200 bucks on a knife. No problem. Get it home. Take a look at it and put it in the case. I'm definitely not like that with anything. Um, but I, I definitely buy more axes than I do knives. Um, it's just, it's weird. Over the past few years, I've sort of just been collecting knives without even meaning to. Um, oh, Dauber likes the sound tonight. That's good because um, I am using my very, very uh, hobbled computer tonight. I'm running it under Windows because I still can't get my Mac OS um, partition to work. It's going to happen, though. It has to happen. I have to get back to editing my, my videos. Um, let me see. Hold on. Um, yeah, a lot of old Gerbers were good. There's... Um, in fact, there's one old Gerber model that I don't remember the I don't remember the model number, but it's like a legendary knife, and it's very very old school. Like the design, the look is you know it's nothing special, but man, people who can find one just grab them. I don't remember the. I think Wrangler Star did an episode on that model at one point too, because uh, he'd had one as as a younger as a youngin. Uh, and I, I think that if if anyone was gonna be buying a Gerber. If, Today, I would say try to find an older one. eBay that stuff, you know. Um, uh, Colin, I, I I haven't watched Forged in Fire very much. I can only see it like on YouTube because I don't get any channels. <laughs> I get channels, but you know, I don't have cable. Um, but if you want to suggest a Forged and Fire episode that I can find on the YouTubes, then I would definitely check it out. Wood Pigeon says, I'm not a knife guy, but I got about 10 knives. Yeah, I exactly. I've, I don't understand how this happened. <laughs> um, oh, Colin's like that with bows. I wonder if that's a lot more expensive than with knives and axes. Uh, I knew someone was going to bring up the Yakari Puko because uh, that knife for the price hits way, way, way above its weight class. Um, I, I don't own one yet, but I do know people who have them, and uh, they're very, very, very popular. It's like um, uh, it's like Alexander Keith's India Pale Ale. Those who like it, like it a lot. Uh, I guess the Americans here won't get that, actually. So um, I just put the invite up, but I, I'll tell you guys about some of it. I have my favorite knives here, um, and and each of them are a favorite for a different reason. This is, I mean, you guys have seen all these knives before, uh, but I figure I'll start things off with a little show and tell. Um, this knife's been beaten to hell. It, you know, it's a very sort of, um, rough and ready looking knife right now. Um, when it came, the sheath was not wet formed. I did that myself on video, like, yeah, my second year, or first or second year doing this. Uh, it's just your straight up Woodlore clone, right? As you guys know, I call it my Aussie Woodlore clone because it's made in Australia and is still the only one by this guy in Canada. Um, and I don't think he's making knives anymore, so it's probably not going to be joined by any others in this country. Uh, <clears throat> um, Desert Ironwood scale, uh, scales, yeah. Black liners, that was a mistake. I should have gone for yellow. What, one of the things I like about it is the fact that the handle is not round. Um, those of you who are adherents to the Morris Kohansky um, school of knife grip will understand why I like that. Um, and in fact, uh, the reason uh, I would love to tell you that that um, Campbell uh, was it 
Campbell Bushcraft knives. Matt Campbell Bushcraft knives is one of, is one of my favorite knife makers. Uh, but I don't think he's doing it anymore, as I said. Um, and when he did this, when he was starting out, and so to me, um, as as a you know as a knife you make, how am I? I'm trying to say something, but it's not coming out. Like I think that for someone who is at that point just getting started in knife making, this is a really nice job. Very nice. Like the you you can't really see it, but the grind is dead center. Uh, it's a nice thickness. I think it's a four mil blade. Um, it, but it's very very basic, right? There's no there's no tapered tang. There's no distal taper on this or anything. It's it's a very very traditional wood lore with no fancy stuff. Um, I did that myself. Uh, so what makes this my favorite knife? Well, it's, it was my first real bushcraft knife. But it's all about... I, I love the woodlore shape. I love the shape of the woodlore blade. Um, I like having this little... Uh, I can't remember any of my terminology tonight. Because um, I like not slipping onto the blade while I'm working and my hands are getting slippery or sweaty. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Um, now, one thing that I do wish, and I, I'll give it, I'll, you know, I give Jeb a uh, a pass on this because he was he was a beginner when he did this. Not a beginner, but he was at, sort of at the beginning of his career. Is that what I would like to see? Is that? Let me center that. See that little? Ah, it's hard to do mirrored. See that little round divot? You know why I like that round divot? I'm going to tell you, because I'm the one with the microphone. The reason I like that round little divot, it's just tough to do, because I always want to, you know, recasing my knives. It's really hard to sharpen right into that corner, man. You know, so if you're, like, even remotely ADD about this kind of thing, it's going to drive you nuts. Um and you don't see that very often on very, very, very affordable blades, right? Nothing on that one. Um, and even on some more, you know, even on some pricier knives, you don't see that because it's it's sort of a it's a design element thing, right? Like it's not on this. And at a hundred bucks, I would expect you know I'd expect something, but they they don't do that, right? Zamora. You know, some some makers do that, and some don't. Uh, but it it really eases, it smooths the road for me while I'm while I'm sharpening because I don't have that little tiny bit that can't be sharpened that really really bugs me. Uh, I'm just gonna sort of get back to the side, <sighs> get back to the side chat there. Um, I, I don't want to uh, I don't want to ignore anyone who's you know popped in. Tyler loves the Puko, and he absolutely loves knives. I think I remember us talking about this, and I, I remember you like the Puko design. Um, yes, Wood Pigeon, I did handle a Puko for my daughter, and I did a, a video or three on that. Um, I'm glad I did that. I, I really liked that experience. And I, and I liked the look on her face when she opened it. Speaking of opening, before we go any farther, any further, let's talk about tonight's beer, shall we? Who's who's drinking tonight? Who's drinking and what are you having? Uh, um, what I'm having is a sweet Jesus Scotch Ale. Um, never had it before, because that's the tradition around here. You know, have a beer that I've never had before. Um, some real hit or miss with Scotch Ale, so I don't know if this is going to be great or not. 473 mils. Typical. Uh, oh, it's by Saint Buck, I think is the yeah Saint Buck. It's a microbrewery in uh, around here somewhere here in in the Quebecs. Uh, brewed by Brasseur du Monde Saint Hyacinthe. Okay, so it's in Saint Hyacinthe, Quebec. Canadian beer, American beer glass, uh, Rock Art Brewery, Morrisville, Vermont. All right, Scotch Ale. Ooh, I can smell it from here. It 
So I think there's a write-up. You guys want to hear the, the Purple Pros write-up? I know that Outdoor Dauber loves it when I do this. Oh, it's in French. No, there's English on there. Seated at the right hand of its creator, sweet Jesus is the envy of all heaven. Okay. This delicious Scotch ale welcomes you with pure spirit and an old and an, with a pure spirit and an angelic smile. Its notes of Scottish caramel and candied sugar combined with a subtle smokiness will inspire you to share its blessing with your disciples. Go ahead, enter the gates of beer paradise by quenching your thirst with this divine brew contains barley all right oh it's high octane wow what are whoa christ it's 10 percent it's gonna be fine it's gonna be great i've got a bunch of blades here i'll just drink it very slowly um but yeah, there's caramel there. It's very uh, when it, when they're high octane like that, it can be hard to get that the taste around the uh, around the ethanol though. Um, just want to finish, and I right, we got someone waiting in the green room. That's good. Dale Bruce says I'm like that with kitchen knives, not expensive ones or anything, but I do like my kitchen knives. You know what I would like to have is a set of Japanese kitchen knives. Like not not a not like twelve hundred bucks a knife or anything, but a, a, sort of a nice set of Japanese kitchen knives. Would not be worth it to purchase them at this point in my life. But um, um, I I practice my sharpening on my current German kitchen knives. When I get that really squared away, then I'll maybe you know, up, uh, kick it up to a set of Japanese knives. Uh, Dorn, he, Dorn, he didn't want, but he was on the show and he's a friend of mine. Season 7, episode 161. Okay. Kincaid, I'll, uh, Colin, I'll take a look. Hey, Adam Romano's here. How's it going? Uh, Tyler says he doesn't prefer knives with distal taper. They seem to not hold to prying if necessary. That's true. Colin's all-time favorite knife is the Mora Classic Number no. One. I don't have one of those, but I do want one of those just because I like. I have a thing for the old school, as you guys know. Um, Mark is having peppermint tea. Yeah, Dauber man, you you uh your you your life is a little different than it used to be, eh? Um, I'm glad to know that you're, you've got a good job going though. Colin just finished a Pepsi. Uh, I'm just making sure that we're like, uh, hmm. Arg. <laughs> oh, thank you, mister. It's funny because someone said that during the last live stream and I just explained that I don't go anywhere. I don't see anyone. So what's the point of, of shaving? You know, that I only shave down here because it drives me nuts. <coughs> Dale, in fact, went for went the same thing. I like the Japanese ones. Um, but yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna buy it on Amazon. There's a there's a store in Calgary that um, sells good knives and the prices aren't bad. So when I'm ready, I'll just do that. <clears throat> um what? Tyler, you leaving the house early? What's going on? You going hunting? Oh, yes, yes, you are. Oh, you had a bob. You had it yourself a brother's of bushcraft. Oh man. Uh. Hey. 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 <laughs> uh, yeah, you gotta mute your sound there. I got I got to meet my sound. Oh well, I, oh, well I, the speaker. The speaker. Uh, uh, not the speaker. On. I mean, not, not the headphone, but the actual speaker. Okay, because the actual speaker is on the mic. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, I see. All right. Um, Colin. <laughs> Good to know. Uh, so what's, All right, um, what's um? Sorry, let me check uh, some. All right. Maybe. 
That's better. All right. So I'll do it like that then. How's it going, everybody? Um, so what's you uh what, what's your favorite knife maker, man? My favorite knife maker? Um tell you the truth, I don't usually go for custom knives. Uh I like the old school stuff. Like uh for example, I got you were doing the show and tell and everything, so you know, one of these guys wait the old school your, like your frozen. Oh, uh, there we go. Oh, yeah, I see what you're talking about. Yeah, hold that you one good? up again. Yeah. Yeah, hold that one up again. Right. Yeah. Oh, here, let me do it like this. There we go. All right. And why I like it, it's small. It's like old school. It's tough. Um, And like in the woods, you don't really need a huge uh knife or anything right yeah you need you need something that's i would say about the width of your hand and because one of my first knives that i bought was the uh, Solagen armoso so, oh yeah you know like the a big the, chopper the old school and i had this in storage for years yeah, you know, and I had that, and it was fun to use. That's what, what I used, and I thought, you know, bigger the knife, the better the woodsman. That's when I first mm -hmm. started, and I was 16. Yeah. Right? And then I learned over the years, uh, you know, just whatever's function and works in your hand. Yeah. You know? And then, uh, but speaking of collecting knives and everything, uh Where's sorry, I'm still trying to figure out where my camera is on this phone. Yeah. So so this is a ebony wood uh knife mm -hmm. that uh my wife got me in, from uh Africa and she got me a set of these. And I went she went, Oh, I bought you a knife. I went, Oh sweet. You know, but like I can't really do anything with this in in the woods. But it is a nice little topic piece and one of my Favorites. How sharp is it? Oh, it's actually pretty decent. Like, like I can't really put the phone. Can I put the phone down? Let's see here. Like, she doesn't shave hairs or anything. Mm -hmm. But uh, where's the? There we go. But like, if you go like this, she does do some minor scrapings on the thumbnail there. Why don't you just try shaving that cat? Oh, this one. Yeah. Don't really try shaving the cat. Don't really shave the cat, for God's sakes. <laughs> really get monetized then, right? Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah. let's not do that. And then um, um like and then about two years ago I wanted to get into knife making. So yeah, just made that. a little, little neck knife. Oh, that's the neck knife? Nice. What are you gonna yeah. use for scales? Uh that I don't know. I went and I made the knife, and I went, okay, what am I going to put for for scales for the handle? And I was like, I have no idea. Right. And then uh, and then the whole uh, Canadian jump knife, I don't know if you know what that is. No. Um, what's his name? Uh, Dave Cantberry talked about it for a while, and it was like a big, like... It was a big hype knife, and then I got into the big hype of it. So, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the uh, sorry, I didn't recognize like when you went the jump knife. You're talking about the one that Groman makes, like that style, yeah. the one based on the Groman jump knife. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah or, I know that knife. Also known as Canadian uh, jump knife. Uh, the reason why they call it the Canadian jump knife was because they gave it to uh, Air Force pilots, the Canadian pilots in the Air Force. Yep. And they loved it because it was a all round, good size, good mm -hmm. utility knife. Everybody's like fit everybody's hands nicely. Yeah. Uh, didn't matter. Didn't matter what the size of your palms were. So, and then uh, that's why I made this one. Right, sort of like the same, 
style. It's based on the same shape, essentially. Yeah, and uh, like the I, I didn't version. know what I was. I didn't know what I was going for. I saw your video on doing the puko handle. Yep. Right, and then I went. No, I want to make one of those. And then I went. No, I want to make a jump knife. No, and then I just drew something up and went with it, and that's what I came up with. So, well, you know, when I rehandled one of my kitchen knives, um, I just used um, not G10, not uh, what's it called? Uh, like sometimes they make countertops out of it. Um, like granite? No, no, no. It's just it's a synthetic. It's essentially like G10, but it's okay. Oh well. Anyway, <clears throat> but it was it was pretty simple. I mean. I, I had to drill out the holes through the handle to, to fit the, the pin. Okay. Um, but then I just sort of cut the the scales essentially to shape, stuck them on, and then did final shaping on my belt sander. Okay. And, was, uh, well, that's Corian, the too, thank you, yeah. thank you, thank you, thank you, Primal Edge. It was It's Corian, exactly. There you go. Oh, man, so, that was hard. Sorry, I <laughs> and sorry guys, if I'm not in the chat, I can't see the chat while I'm in the in the live. So right. I, I think everybody understands that. Yeah. So uh, I'm getting sort of behind um get behind on the side chat there. Um <clears throat> I do have the the invite up for anyone who might want to get on and talk about their favorite knives, their favorite knife maker, uh, what are the elements to a knife that they really like. Now, uh, for for you, uh, speaking of knife makers, I I know you're an axe guy. Yep. Uh, and you've already talked about the gentleman that made uh, your knife. Is there any other uh, knife makers, or do you like? Uh, um, and again, I'm going to refer to uh, Dave Canberry there. He liked to take the old school uh, hickory knives. Mm-hmm. Oh, hickory, old hickory, yeah, and, and then reshape them. Yeah, a lot of guys do that because they're 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 everywhere, and apparently the steel is really really good. Yeah. Well, I ended up going to the thrift shop uh, by my place. There's three uh, thrift shops mm -hmm. uh, by my place, and I ended up finding a bunch of knives with hickory handles, and uh, it's a hit or miss there for their knives yeah. because a lot of times it's all serrated edges. But right. I just found some and uh, really nice uh, kitchen knives. And I'm like, yeah, I'm buying these up. And I think I bought five knives for like two bucks. Nice. Nice. Uh, that was I'm, uh, I'm going to let Johnny on because he's been waiting to. But one another maker that I really like is. Um, oh, bloody hell. I forgot his first name, but someone white. He made my my mini Puko, uh, my mini um, Nesmuk. Uh, Tyler or um, Outdoor know exactly the company I'm talking about. Somebody white. Jack White? No. No, he's a musician. Um, but I would like, say Sean the, White, but that's a skateboarder. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, but like the knives are really cheap and, and they're built. They're, they're made the way they would have been like 200 years ago. Very, very plain. There, there's like no high-end elements to it, but I love them. I want I want the Nesmuk, the full size Nesmuk by by uh, by that guy. And in fact, he retired and like he took on um an apprentice and then he retired. So the apprentice is making the, the knives now. No, no, it's not um it's not uh, blind horse. It's something white. Uh, Jeff Jeff White. Thank you, Evolve Outdoors. Oh. Jeff White. Thank you. Hold on a sec. All right. Hey well, Johnny. Hey, Johnny, 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 John, Johnny's still on mute. There you go. Johnny's all muted. There gonna work. Now, do you want me to hop off and let Johnny have more airtime, or do I stay on? What do you like me to do? It's up to you. You yeah, can I... you can pop on. You can pop off if you want. You can come back on later if you want. It's up to you. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll hop off. Let other uh, guys take the show. Sure. All right. Thanks for having me on, Johnny. You're up. Okay. It's good seeing you. Hold on here. I got things set. There we go. Johnny, I've been meaning to ask you yeah. uh, because I, I do a bushcraft channel. 
And I met you through a homesteading channel. Yeah. Do you have bush knives or is like all of your knife experience kitchen knives? You know, this is great. And I really love this subject because there's two things that, uh, that I love in life is fire and knives. You know, it's part of how I wound up in the kitchen, right? You're right. <laughs> but I, yeah, I do actually have some, um, some outdoor knives and okay. as you know, I do a lot of fishing too. So oh, yeah. it's necessary. If I had like a beater chef knife that I pretty much worn the curve off and it's like seen better days, mm -hmm. I'll throw that in my tackle box and not have to care about it. But, uh, usually for the fishing, I'll carry the Mora here. I'll show you. Uh, so I got, I got some deer before, and then I also got some hogs with some friends. Mm -hmm. So I'll show you the knife I use for cleaning the, uh, the wild game that I get. And I just go with the uh, the old fashioned buck, Jesse. So oh yeah, everyone who's anyone has seen these. I mean, I yep. had one growing up, and I've had this one for quite a long time. And it's a great, great knife for cleaning game. So I'll start with this. Yeah, yeah, that's a classic look, man. That's like the classic American hunting knife. Yeah, yeah, and that's part of like the iconic hunting knife right there, and. Yep. Um, you know, it works really well. I do have to say right. there's ones out there that are probably better, but this is the one I really like. I've used it a bit and, you know, I won't clean my meat with it. You know, I'll take it and use it to skin and do all the, the hard work. Yeah. And uh, I got a cleaver for breaking bones down, you know, because I use every part of the animal when I, when I get one. You know, I'll make I'll make stock and sauce and uh, demi and all that stuff. At some point, by the way, Johnny, you mentioned the cleaver word. At some point, uh, I want us to talk about cleavers because I would love a good cleaver for the kitchen. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's it's the thing that just keeps sort of. But you froze up a little bit. Thing, but man, I would love. You're breaking up a little bit, Jesse. Hopefully, it's not me. Yeah. Oh, it's you. Oh, it's, okay. Uh, the cleaver. As far as cleavers go, man, there are so many options for cleavers. You know, you can get a German cleaver. And I tell you what, I'll uh, tell you my favorite cleaver. I don't mm -hmm. have it right now, but uh, is a global. You're aware of global from Japan? Yep. So if you get that global cleaver, mm -hmm. that, thing, that thing's like brilliant. It's like a tank. I used to be a butcher for Spago for a while. And that was what I used to break down my bones. And Wait, uh, Spago, you mean like in L.A.? Uh, no, Spago Maui. We have oh, one okay. at the Seasons Hotel. Yeah, I've been to the one in LA and I'm friends with those guys too. But yeah, uh, cause I've, I've eaten there before. Yeah, did you like it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The one in LA was hard to get into. Yeah. Uh, we were there. I was working at it. This is, I'll make this real quick because it's way off target. Um, <laughs> But I was working at a tech company that had created a really good video codec. Yeah. And so we were in LA for a tech, like a, a tech show. Okay. And we decided to to hit Spago one one night. But it's really hard. It was at that point. This is like the '90s. I don't know if it's sort of done this since then or not. But it, uh, at that point, it was really hard to get into. So my boss call. Uh, my boss had one of our team call and said, "Look." We know it's short notice, but um, Senator, Go well, I'm not going to use his name. Senator so and so is is here from from Ottawa, Canada, and he he needs you know he needs a table for for himself, a bodyguard, and and two attaches. And so we got the table, and so we went, and he was called Senator all night because Americans don't know shit about Canadian politics. They have no idea who's a senator and who's not, right? Yeah. Like, oh, you got senators up there? Yeah, we got senators. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so, yeah, so I was an, an attache or a something. He was a senator. Uh, our biggest guy was like, <laughs> was a, yeah, <laughs> a bodyguard. You even have one of those little things in the ear. Uh, was, <laughs> so, no. But the food was good, um, except that the waiter, everything he, he was talking about was a presentation. Yeah. And I, I hate that kind of talk. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't go to very many... I go to some really expensive restaurants, but I try not to because it's always like this. Sort of, okay, so the, the foie gras is a presentation of this, that, and the other. Four different presentations on the plate. We played it this way. Play. Stop. Just tell me about the food. 
Yeah, yeah, no, that's what they do. It's sort of like how they're trained now for table side service. Yeah. So, you know, they're supposed to showcase all the ingredients, you know, so they have to sit there and talk your ear off when, you know, really you just want to be left alone and eat. Have you it's, seen LA Story? No, I haven't. Oh, okay, because they go to a, a restaurant called Lidio, and yep. um, it's kind of that experience. But just like this total, just a cutaway scene, right, is a guy doing that, talking about all the ingredients to a table, sort of in the background, and he's wrapping it. <laughs> You've got to see that movie. <laughs> I, I think you would enjoy that movie. I, I've seen it like a million times. <laughs> awesome. LA Story, check it out. Okay, I'll watch it. Check this um, out. But yeah, show me a knife. knife. Show me a knife. I'll show you. So we'll start with the fishing knife, and then I'll show you my EDC. Okay. Now this knife, you know Mora. Everyone knows Mora. Yep. So I, they're they're dirt cheap. I got it for like thirty bucks, you know. And so in that note, I bought four. You know, I got one for each tackle box. So I oh yeah, okay. Out. Yeah, one in my bag. But uh, yeah, right here. So this one, so you got the Mora Companion. That's the uh, the cheap one that you can just pick up, and I think that's like. Geez, it's probably like 10 bucks or something. Yeah. This one, this one is the the rugged. The, ro the robust. Yeah, the robust. I, I have that one, yep. Yeah, you do? Yeah. Yep. You know what I really like about this one is the handle. Yep. The handle's got this layer of rubber. Mm -hmm. So when I'm in the water, I'm handling like, if I got like an eel or something that's like a little on the slick side. Yeah. I could take this. I can actually <clears throat> rip onto it while my hands are wet or sweaty. And I can scale the fish with the back of the knife and then go to work and clean it up. Because the back of the knife is rough on that, right? Yeah, it is. You see that? Yeah. And it's, <clears throat> it's a, that's a really thick blade. Yeah, and it shows the, the lamination and everything. I, I, I could never figure out why they did that. Because like my companion, they ground they ground the, uh, the, the spine of it flat. Really? Yeah. So, yeah. but This one, it, it is a little bit rigid, but it's not flat. No, no, yeah. exactly. They, they don't finish it off. Yeah, um, I can stick with it, you know. So, and this is uh, basically what I carry in my tackle box, you know. As you can see, the only qualm I have with it is high carbon steel. Yeah, so you got to keep. Yeah. I got to clean this right away. You can see it's got a couple of rust spots. Yeah, you got to keep them oiled. Yeah, that's from uh, from just me throwing it in my tackle box, you know, and uh, it having a little bit of salt water on it from the ocean, and uh, and it'll get at it. Yeah. It'll get. Yeah, I got that. My uh, normal knives I use, like a lot of people are against tactical knives, and I'm completely for them. I love tactical knives. Oh, do you? Yeah, I've had this knife for about, geez, almost 15 years, and this is a CRKT. Okay. This one is pretty much like a response knife, and my favorite edge on my knives, this is cool because it's got the flipper. Yeah. This one has the double flipper, so it protects your hands. So... Like that. Oh, you got the serrated edge and everything, eh? Yeah, these are my favorite blades. Is Tonto? Yeah. And I got the half serrated, half straight. Those are my favorite edges. They're they're rugged and they serve a great purpose. Like this thing. I mean, I don't know if you can see it. I actually, I see it. I chipped the tip and chipped there. <clears throat> I was using it as a screwdriver one day. You know. <laughs> yeah. So it's just a great, great tool. You know. So that is like actually one of my EDCs right there. Show is that one way. like in your pocket all the time? Yeah. Yeah. This is my, my EDC. And I yeah. also have one here. I got my pants over here. I'm opening it up. I got these cargos that I, that I wear normally. And um, those, all these things that I'm showing you now are usually what I carry on my person. So another great knife that I really, really love. That's basically my backup that I carry. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, I got these cool leather pouches. This one doesn't quite fit, so I just let it do its thing like that. I got these pouches. These are made for uh, Leatherman tools. Yep. And they're actually made out of rugged, real leather. This one is the Benchmade. So, oh. I love Benchmade knives. This one. I, I am pining for the knife. I think it's the 940. They're Osborne. Uh, pining this, for it. Really? Really? Yeah. This thing right here is one of the best knives I've ever had. And it's the same edge, Jesse. This one's uh, automatic. Yep. And you can see. Yeah. What a great, beautiful edge it has. And that the serrations, everything. I mean, I can cut through uh, marine rope with that. Or, you know, if I wind up in a serious situation and have to cut a seatbelt off, mm -hmm. this, it'll make it through a seatbelt. 
you know so i love love it if you're looking to get a bench made I, I think you're you're looking in the right you won't be you won't be uh upset that you got it that's for sure yeah it, it's getting really awkward in canada right now um Really? Because uh, folders, some there's some classification of. I'm not going to get political about this, and I'm not going to do a deep dive on this because it's boring for anyone who's not Canadian. But uh, there's a whole class of um, folding knives that are not technically illegal, but that the border agency will no longer allow into the country. Oh, that's um, so uh, you know, I that that Osborne that I'm dying for, I may never actually get to see you know right. i may never because it's not worth it for me to spend money on because that's an expensive knife it's the 940 right the osborne yeah it, it is expensive. that's a lot of money for a knife that i may not see arrive at my door yeah i think that knife that knife is running about uh close to six hundred dollars it's, it's wow. an expensive knife maybe more in your area in your neck of the woods uh the one i'm i was thinking about is is the um the one with the uh I don't know, the scales are different. It's not the aluminum scales because it's a little cheaper, but I don't think they're that expensive. Okay. But even okay. if it's only like a couple of hundred bucks, it's still too much for me to spend for something that may not appear, you know, really? at my door. Because to me, 200 bucks is a good bottle of scotch, right? Yeah. Oh. And I know that I'll get, I'll get that. So. Got a, uh, a Griptilian from Benchmade. And, uh, oh, yeah. It? Those are nice. I got that one, and that one was 200 bucks. Yeah. And it's a great knife, too. And I got the same edge. You know, I like yep. it. The handle's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But I still like it because it's mostly it used to be made with that steel and then have that overcoat. Right. Now it's fully polymer. So pretty cool. Right. My, another EDC that I carry that I really love and I'd recommend to anyone is um, a Leatherman. Oh, yeah. OK. So this one is the Leatherman Wave. Yep. And uh, it has every tool on it. I got screwdriver. I got um, nail clippers in here. But one of the things that turned me on to this knife against all the other ones and the reason why i chose it is because it's got two different files in it two different so, files yeah it's got two files in it for sharpening tools and sharpening fish hooks oh okay that's what's great about carrying this is hence if, the wave yeah if your knife goes dull one of your other knives like say your hunting knife stall you could use this to sharpen those other knives yeah so that was my main appeal to this blade and this knife here and it also has pliers so you can yeah, get fish Fish hooks out and all that, you know, and, and that's pretty necessary, especially uh, if you catch some fish with some sharp teeth, you're going to want, you want this. Or if they right. swallow, they swallow the hook, you know, then you got to get it out with pliers. You're not getting that out barehanded. I'm, um, it's funny because I, I have an old, uh, an old Leatherman Spark, I think Spark somewhere. I don't know where the hell it is. Um, I think I keep it in the car because, you know, the tools. Yeah. But for... Um, for EDC, I, I want something smaller. I'm thinking that my next multi tool is going to be like a Victorinox. Yeah, Swiss Army. You know? Yeah, I mean, except you gave up on the pliers though for that, right? Yeah, that's the thing. So but it's just like I, I, I'm not a guy who loves having his pockets full of stuff, and I don't like having a bunch of sheaths on my belt. You know, I wear uh, I wear cargo, so I don't even keep anything on my belt. You know, but I do I do carry a lot. I mean, yeah. I got. I got my slingshot here in my pocket. I got the Scout LT, you know, and I carry that everywhere. Okay. So it's just the thing. And then I got the haversack, you know, that I keep like, you know, other random cool stuff, you know, like yep. I keep my Mora, you know, and a pack of beef jerky in case I'm like starving, you know, that sort of thing. You should you always know? have a pack of beef jerky on you. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. I always keep a pack on me, you know? Uh, yeah. I have um, a slight preference for pemmican, but. it's great. Yeah, a great one. I got Jack Link sitting in here. My favorite right now is uh, Old Trapper. Old Trapper? Yeah, Old Trapper is really good. The original Old Trapper, and I like the peppered one too. Right. Yeah. Good stuff. So, <clears throat> like I told you about the cleaver, Jesse, your best bet, man, if you want to get something high end that's nice, that's going to last forever, is a global. Global. Thing, okay. My only qualm with the globals. And the reason why I don't use them all the time in the kitchen is that steel is so hard, it's really difficult to sharpen. So, okay. 
you got to keep your edge on there. If you lose your edge, you're like going to cry. You're like doomed. You're going to be there sharpening that thing with the stone for like an hour. Okay. So, or, or even using um, a bench sander, you know, for my, um, for my sharpening, I don't generally use it unless I'm really like in the, in the dumps, you know? And, uh, I got the work sharp. I want the work sharp. I got the work sharp. Yeah, I had to afford the work sharp, but I want the the Ken, the Ken onion uh, version. Yep. Yep. Oh, I want That's it so what, hard. It, it's a good, good sharpener. I've actually used it to, uh, to sharpen one of my shovels. Uh, what I'm, what I like about it is that it runs at a speed that isn't going to blow the, uh, the, the temper. Right. Whereas yeah. my big ass, my, my, my bench sander, you know, poof, take it yeah. off. Poof, yeah. Take it off glass of water you know I, i'm always afraid of like blowing my my temper uh, for but, sure yeah. yeah um that the thing is just brilliant it works great and the belts are cheap so yeah. you can get a full pack of replacement belts for like eight bucks you know i really i'm really happy with it i've had it i've had it i saved for probably close to 10 years now and mm. it, it, it still works great and uh my wife she goes to work she doesn't sharpen any of her knives Guess who's got a sharpener for her? This, this guy. guy. Yeah. Um, so, well, so where does she work? She works at the Four Seasons. She's a pastry chef. Oh, so you're you're both cooks. Yeah. Yep. You're a, yeah. you're a sushi chef, and she's a pastry chef. Exactly. Supper at your place must be unbelievable. Awesome. <laughs> now the tragedy about that, because we eat a lot of sushi here, because my my yep. daughter loves it. The smaller daughter also loves it. Um, my wife loves it. Uh, and fish kills me, so I have the the vegetarian. Um, well, not all fish, but like all the the, the pink, the, the fatty fish, oily fish, whatever the word in English is for a poisson gras. So, like salmon, done, shark, done. Yeah, I can yeah. eat all the white, boring fish, really. Well, you know, there's yeah. some beautiful and awesome mackerels that you can have. Like, Saba's pretty fatty, but it's still really good. Yeah, and one of my favorite um white fishes we use is compati. <laughs> Which is an Almaco Jack, and okay. then you got Aji, you got Shima Aji, and then you got um, Opaka. Some of these fish you can't get out there, I know, and um, you can get Kohata, which is a uh, shad, okay. and that, that is one of my favorites too. It's brilliant. They marinate it before they uh, they turn it into nigiri sushi. Yeah, hmm. so a lot of the, those fish we don't usually do for sashimi. It's mostly nigiri. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's one one bite stuff. But oh yeah, I see. Yeah, so an, another thing with the knife, the cleaver. I'll show you this uh, cleaver that I got in my kitchen, Jesse. That um, if you nick it or you dent it, you're not gonna cry. I I use it to clean whole lobsters. I cut a lobster straight in half, and it went straight in the walk. I got a video. I sent it to Colin. I don't know if he's watched it yet. It's me um catch and cook lobster walk style. So I walk I walk fried a lobster, and uh, I broke it down alive. So why don't you drop that into the... Oh, because you can't drop anything into the side chat. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> I think Colin can. Colin can do it. I don't think he can do it either. Is he even really? still here? I don't know. I know that a couple of people said, like, gotta go to bed. Um, yeah, I uh, I um, can't see the chat. I can see uh, Mark here. Leatherman Squirt has pliers that are small. Yeah, that, that seems interesting to me because I... I I th I've sort of set my mind on getting a uh, Victorinox. Here's the thing. I don't go anywhere anymore, right? And I'm not going anywhere until March at least. Like, because I don't, like, I work at home now because of the whole shutdown and everything. Yeah. So, excuse me. So if I need pliers, you, you got I walk like six meters that way and grabs yeah. them off the wall. I mean, I, yeah, I can turn around right now. And, and, you know, I got a set of channel locks here, you know? It's like those are a lot nicer than my channel locks. Are those the Nipex? No, these are just little uh they're the Robo Grip style that I got from automotive. Oh. It's just made for like small automotive stuff, changing yeah. batteries, banging around, you know, stuff like that. I like having them just because uh I, I always like having channel locks around. I don't carry them on my EDC because I got the Leatherman, but uh yep. it's it's just a handy tool for getting anything apart. Like yep. if you want to put a jam, you know. So it's good stuff. <clears throat> Now I gave Nate Muskoka the invite to get in here to, to chat because I want to know about this because I know where Nate works, um, I and I, I want to know why he uses the pliers almost every day at work. Uh, but Johnny, there's a question for you, which I'm putting on screen now from Steve on Oahu. 
Oh, yeah. Okay. So before I came on, Steve was asking about it. So, Steve, I uh, use stones. So let's show you some stones in my kitchen. And I'll show you that that cleaver right now, Jesse, and some other small knives. And then we'll get into what I carry at work. Yeah. Because I've got hundreds and hundreds of knives for work because I was working in three different kitchens. I'd spend two days at the sushi bar. I'd spend two days up at the plantation working wood fire at the mill house. And then I'd spend another two days working for a regular restaurant down here downtown. Okay. So it was two, two, two. I do two, do two days each and then have one day to be incapacitated. And do you, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so when you're, when you're a chef, do you bring your own knives to work then? Or does the, the chicken, the, by which I'm at kitchen, what <laughs> does the kitchen supply the knives? No, no, you must bring your own knife. Yeah. Interesting. And, and plus, uh, on top of that, we'll get onto this, Jesse, is it's super important for me to bring my own blades because I'm a southpaw. Oh, so okay. We'll up and if everyone's got a right hand knife and also, too, there's a policy in the kitchen. OK, there's a statement. Touching another man's knife is like touching his you know what. Yeah, you yeah. Touch, you don't touch another man's knife. You just don't do it. It's, it's the same with axes, in my opinion, and several people's opinions, like some old school uh, outdoors men are like, you can touch my wife, but don't touch my axe. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, it's like it could be a highly heated thing. It's a good way to get in a fight in the kitchen. You know, interesting. You catch, you catch someone with your knife, man. It's blasphemy. Because <laughs> I mean, I've worked in a kitchen, but it's a whole different ball of wax when you're just working in a pub. Than yeah. in a than in a, a high end kitchen, you know. And so I've I've only ever worked in pubs before. I was a, a sous at a pub, yeah. and they just supplied you know your typical kitchen knives, right? Gray yeah. plastic handle, yeah, very basic blade. The uh, thing is, is a lot of us like my chef knife, my sushi knife is four hundred dollars for one. Yeah, yeah, you know these knives are uh, they're up there. You know, in some of these uh, Yanagibas and some of these other sushi knives. They're going for like three, four grand. Yeah. You know, get one that's just perfect from Japan. It's straight from freaking a samurai that makes them, you know? And, uh, and then. Matt, you watch Perfection, right? Um, maybe. I don't think I've seen it. I don't watch series much. I'm stuck on YouTube all the time. No, no, he's on YouTube. Perfection. Okay. It's this guy. Um, it's this guy. He's in California and he's into knives. He does, like, I watch him because I'm dying for a nice set of Japanese knives. Really? You know what I'd, re uh, I'd recommend? Masahiro. Masahiro is one of my favorite. Can I so, afford them, though? On Steve. So for, uh, my, uh, yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> Nate, uh, Johnny's just going to show us something, and then I, I want to I hear from you, mister. Yeah, sorry about that. I had a... I'm using an iPhone, so I've got a bit of a grant. grant. Got, a, right. got a lot of stones, but I'll show you a couple of the basics, okay? Yep. So this is a tri stone. Okay. So it has three different three different grits on it. So you can see, and they're labeled. You got coarse. Yeah, which is probably around a four hundred, right? Yeah, and then you got um, medium. So like eight to a thousand, probably. And then a fine. And that's going to be like a. This is a stone. You got to soak all your stones before you use them. You don't want to use them dry because that's yeah. I, I have soakers too, but I, my next stones I'm going to do splash and goes, like maybe a shaft and glass or something. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit here, and I think I use this one. I use this one more than any of my other stones. This is a regular Japanese red stone. Okay, and you can see. So, and you got to watch out when you're sharpening your knives. If you don't use the entire length of your stone, you'll get a skate ramp. Yeah. And then once you get that skate ramp, the, it's going to mess up your edge. You're not going to have that rock on your edge anymore. Your, your blade will start to go flat on you. So okay. what I do is I use the entire length of my stone, and that's why you can see it's flat, yeah? So my stone is good and flat. And then another good... Um, a good bet is to always use a moist towel so you can use a moist kitchen towel underneath your stone so it doesn't slide around mm. if it slides around you're looking at some nasty cuts so interesting These uh interestingly johnny 
uh, I did a video on knife sharpening with stones way back. So if you can find it, I would love you to to just critique yeah, yeah. critique it. I, I uh, critique my 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 uh, my technique because I also use stones for my kitchen knives. Really? Yeah, yeah. I could definitely uh, definitely show you guys at some point. I like to sharpen my knives, but it'll be a little different. You have to look at it different because, uh, like I said, I'm a southpaw. Yeah. So yeah. You, you'll be doing it like opposite. So right. check. While we're on the kitchen, you can always carry something like this just to hone your blade a little bit if you're on the run. Is that like a little oil stone or something? It's a, a little wet stone. It's split. So each side's got one side's coarse and the other side's fine. Okay. So, yeah. And these are handy you know, to have around if you don't have a stone to show right. them. Yeah. But, so tell you what, Johnny, um, before we, before I get Nate to, to start talking, why don't you just show me that, that cleaver? Yeah. Okay. Let me get that for you right now. Jesse said selfishly because he wants a cleaver. Really, I'll show you a, a few of the knives I just keep in my right kitchen. And then yeah. as we move on, I'll open my knife case for you and show you what I carry at first. So, you know this. This is the one that was issued to you when you were a Suze at a pub. That's the one. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Yep, yeah, that's a Victorinox. Yep. This is your everyday beater chef knife. Yep. It's got a rock on it. It does the job. It's yep. got a, it don't slip, you know, and you, if you break it, you're not going to cry. Right. Okay. Got that. Here's a bread knife. Okay. Yeah. This one's got good teeth on it. I've had it for about 10 years. Yeah. Full tang. It's a Hankles. It's a Hankles. Yeah. I got the same one. Really? Wait, cool. uh, mine are the, the filling. I don't know if that one's a filling or not. I think um, Zwilling is actually Wushtoff. Uh, very, very close. Actually, I think I like the Wushtoff better than I like the Hankles. Well, a lot of people do, actually. But uh... yeah. So, then we got the cleaver, okay? Okay. Now, you can see, this one's full tang. Easy grip. It's got a rock on it. It's got a good edge. And this is just a KitchenAid, Jesse. What? Okay. I think I bought this thing for like 20 bucks. And that's the one you used in your video where you yep. uh, chopped a lobster apart? Yeah. Yep. All right. I will and definitely take a look for that then. This is good and cheap, and you don't have to cry when you beat it up. This is like a hammer. Yeah, because my first one will definitely get beaten up. Really? Yeah, so get that one, you know, and then you won't cry when you break into it. Okay. And then uh, I got another. This is uh, one that I used to work, and now it's just been denominated to home use. I Has it developed that that kind of sweep through just use and use, or was it designed that way? It was actually designed that way. It's like ultra rock, and they discontinued this bottle of the knife. It's made by Shun from Japan. Yes. It's a great Damascus steel. It's lost. Shun. It. it used to be you could see the foldings in it. Now you can't because I've used it too much. And this handle is really good. I have a bunch of Shuns that I use on the regular. This, yeah. These are very, very good knives. So if you want a good set, I would Shun. Shun, Shun is brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah. I think that's what I was... Uh, I think I, I uh, bookmarked a, a Shun set, in fact. Those, you won't be you won't be bummed. I, uh, for my last... Anne's last uh, birthday, I got her a whole set of them. And hmm. she all the time at work and they're like flawless the great first thing you know my birthday is in may may oh i see nice <laughs> yeah, so, <thanks. laughs> well why don't we let nate get on here because uh, i want to i want to know why he's using uh, pliers every day at work okay uh but don't go anywhere johnny because if you got more knives to show then i i want to i want to see them later because uh the show isn't really about kitchen knives, but I really like kitchen knives, so I'm yeah. just being selfish, man. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll stick right here. Yeah. Hey, Nate. Oh, hey, man. Uh, yeah, Johnny definitely needs a, a YouTube uh, channel, that's for sure. Holy crap. I, I agree. Yeah, I, absolutely agree. I think I learned more about kitchen knives in the last two minutes than I have in my entire life right there. That was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think it he makes, needs a YouTube channel as well. 
Yeah, it makes me uh, look over towards my kitchen counter where I have like the generic uh, like knives stuck in the wooden block, and and I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, I've got a, a set of um, of the Henkels the, that's filling in the wooden block, of course. But I, you know, I, I'm one of those who is like Japanese steel over German any day of the week. You know, like all the best knives I've ever touched have been Japanese, and they seem to hold up so much better. You know, it it makes me wonder why. Um, I think it's all out of utility, but it, of course, when we think of bushcraft knives, we think Scandinavian style knives, and, mm -hmm. and Japanese steel doesn't really play a lot into that. And I, I kind of wonder, I kind of wonder why the steel is so good. You know, well, except Nate for the uh, the Felkneven, right? These guys, the those are made in Japan. Felkneven. Oh. I heard of those that's a nice yeah. knife wow it's a beautiful you know when i got this someone one of my viewers because i've been pining for one of these for ages and it's funny because it's not it's not a style of knife that i like very much like i like wooden handles uh wooden scales i like you know but for some reason the the falcon even f1 i've i've had a real pining for i mean look at this ugly ass sheath you know <laughs> Look at this plain ass knife, man! I love this knife. I I love this knife. Wait. It's stainless, which I don't do. I love this knife. It's 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 not a it's not a custom knife. This is the knife that is uh, supplied to pilots in the Swedish Air Force, right? This is their their official survival knife. It's you know, but you know what? If you live in a country where it hits minus forty on occasion, you're gonna love this knife. That's if you live on the coast where you've got to worry about about uh, rust, you're going to love this knife. And the blade shape is just... Yeah, I like I that. love this knife. That's yeah. a real back back blade, too. That's a rugged, rugged back. Sure is. And um, I like four-inch blades. So, so it just it hits all my, you know. you know. And, you know, I've had very wet hands in this uh, this rubberized handle just does not slip so jesse you're wearing like gabba's right of what gabba no no really it's a type of knife from japan and it's basically what they use in um instead of cleavers it's a uh yes 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 okay i know what you're talking about yeah it's mainly like a quarter inch thick blade on yeah. it, breaking through fish bones and breaking through bones when butchering and stuff like that yeah you might want to look into one of those yeah I might I, I fear the price though. Yeah. Uh you can get one uh you can get one pretty cheap. I got I can get one here for about say forty bucks at the regular store. It's not a real nice one, but it's like the cheap and you don't really have to care about it as much. You could toss that thing in your toolbox and not let me, let me tell you something, Johnny, about yeah. when you say you can get something pretty cheap. And Nate can probably back me up on this. <laughs> no. I live in Canada, dude. I can't get anything really cheap. Ah. <laughs> a exchange B um, economies of scale right there's only 35 million of us right you, you can buy Canadian made boots in New York City for three quarters the price you can get them for in Canada okay I see so um, but anyways yeah but Nate man tell me talk oh okay so before I before I really even got into the whole bushcraft thing, I mean years ago, my dad for Christmas one year gave me um, a Leatherman uh, sidekick. <clears throat> oh, the sidekick! That's a classic, man. Yeah, it and is. you know what? I I didn't think too much of it at the time, but um, uh, given that I I've worked in retail and retail management for a long, long time. I started just kind of tucking it into my pocket because I thought, you know, it, it's, it's the kind of Christmas gift where you want to show that it's appreciated and you want to at least make the effort to kind of see where it fits in with your life. Um, and yeah, I think, oh Lord, I can't remember the exact year he gave it to me, but I've carried it in my pocket every day since. And it's, it's absolutely indispensable. Um, yeah. 
and I'll be honest with you, most of the time I'm using it, whether it's the knife end or the pliers end, is for opening boxes or opening yeah. boxes. But <laughs> it saves my saves my teeth, saves my nails, saves my whatever. Yeah. Uh, um, <clears throat> and man, I, I, it's one of those things where like it just it wouldn't it doesn't fit in my pocket like a Swiss Army knife would, and that's what I love about it because of the clip. So the clip sits oh. nicely. Um, so I can carry it in my pocket without having this like weird Swiss Army knife bulge traveling around in, in <laughs> my pocket. Like, <laughs> yeah, that would probably uh, mitigate my problem with my my Leatherman, my Spark, because it doesn't have a clip, right? So it just sort of sits yeah. in my pocket and just yeah. bugs me. Yeah. So the clip, the clip for me is key. Yeah. Okay. Because most of my pants now have basically the imprint of the clip. <laughs> <clears throat> on, the, on the outside of the pocket because that's where it sits all day long until I need it and I use it every single day and it is absolutely indispensable to me and I know you know the steel is not fantastic and and um, and I've, I've sharpened it down to a degree where it like it, the blade like the actual blade doesn't fit back into the tool the same way because I've sharpened it so many times but that's uh, a lot of love yeah I, yep. I will i'll buy this tool again and again and again because for me it's just all about utility and you want the same one yeah and it, it, and you know what because so much crap now comes in so much plastic and ties yep. uh, yep. that the pliers for me are super crucial because yeah uh, pliers for zip ties are key and pliers even just to like whip them out to like punch a hole in that first piece of tape of that box i need opening instead of wasting a knife blade on it yeah okay, okay. oh man it's uh yeah, yeah. all right That's yeah. that makes sense and like i and i'm i'm not a the other part of that too is i i'm not a fancy bushcraft knife guy either even though i would love to be if i had the means i mean i've got a more companion and then if I'm out in the bush, my go-to is a more Garberg. Um, Tell you what, I'll trade one of my knives for a canoe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you got me there. I have I have more canoes than I have knives. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that because I'm dying for a canoe. I don't even know where I'd put one, but I've got to have it, you know? I bet you if you start selling some of your knives and then you go lurking on Kijiji long enough, you'll eventually have a canoe. Yeah. Which and I, I even have, like, the wifely permission to, to buy to Kijiji a, a sort of a starter canoe. Um, I do want to say, Johnny, there are two questions for you in the side chat, and now I've lost them. Oh, yeah. Okay, the first one is, do you use um, straps? Straps? Mm. No, I don't use straps. Uh, we do have steels. So Yeah. They're kind of just unnecessary for any of the things. I also have a ceramic. So it's a stick ceramic. And it's made by Mac. It's from Japan. Yeah. And the thing is brilliant, man. I can sharpen my pocket knife. I can sharpen anything with it. But it is a, a culinary tool. Right. And the other is from Steve on Oahu. Oahu? Oahu? He's on Oahu. Yeah. He's Oahu, yeah. Waikiki. Steve's. He's on Oahu. Uh, and he wants to know if you're on Facebook. Um, no, no, I'm not on Facebook, but you can get me and my wife on Instagram, and uh, it's Da Harpers, like the kind. So you can look us up and then hit me up anytime you want, and you'll be able to see some of the dishes we put up, and, uh, pictures of the kids and fishing and stuff like that. Wait, how do you spell that? I'll put it into the side chat for you. Yeah, it's uh, Da Harpers. D A. Yep. H A R P E R S. S. Yeah. Da Harpers. Yep. So Cause... any. Any of you guys want to join us anytime, you know, there's some cool stuff in there. Like, there's a lot of fish on there right now because we did a lot of fishing. Right. But, uh, hey, Nate, do you fish, by the way? Uh, I'll dip a line now and then. I, I, I'm such a hack at it. Like, I'm I'm worse at it than Martin is. <laughs> <laughs> Martin? If Martin's still here, he's going to hear that dig, what? dude. I thought you were talking about Steve Martin. <laughs> no. No. No, I, uh, no, I, I'll... Uh, I grew up fishing, but I kind of left it behind for a number of years and I'm just kind of slowly getting back into it. And, uh, um, I definitely need to do more of it. Um, it's just, it's really hard if I'm out paddling, I mostly paddle by myself. Yeah. 
So I'm managing basically a hundred pound dog in front of me right? and, and the paddle and uh, sometimes my phone for taking pictures and now and then a beverage and so to add a fishing rod just now and then yeah you know to add a fishing rod with a sharp implement on the end is uh can get a little complicated yeah <laughs> um up north of 60 says that his favorite belt knife is an se5 mm -hmm. it's a little bigger than i tend to carry but he's in a whole different part of the world than i'm in and his edc is a benchmade adamas yeah. Great knife to me is one that is just a jack of all trades and a master of none. Um, and you're the same way with with axes, eh? Um, like his axes. I mean, you guys, if you haven't watched his videos, yeah, stop what you're doing. Well, after this after this live stream, stop what you're doing, and for God's sakes. Um, but a lot of the stuff he he has is very sort of you know rough and ready. It works, and that's because that's the thing. That's all you really need. Right. The fact that I like a wooden, you know, wooden scales on my on my wood lore and everything. At the end of the day, your knife just has to work. Your axe just has to work. Your canoe just has to work. But we all want Swift or Novacraft because we want, you know, the slightly more intangibles. Right. Yeah. And, um, and it's the same with with that. Well, maybe the weight is actually more tangible than I'm talking about. But because I deal with that with bases all the time. Right. I, I, have a, I have a question for you guys, and this is coming from a perspective of kind of like a, you know, someone that's just getting into bushcraft and, and likes the tools of it, but I'm very, very utilitarian about it. Um, but also as a retailer, I mean, we talk about all these like fancy, you know, one-off Scandinavian knife makers that make, you know, extremely proficient and beautiful bushcraft knives. But where does, like, Jesse, especially for you, I mean your mind where does a manufacturer like Hele fall into things for you like fall into that whole picture for you. well here's the thing about Hele for me there's one model of Hele that i'm dying for um and it's the tamagami mm -hmm. sorry the tamagami and that's because of that sort of half tang i find that um well, tamagami the tamagami is full yeah but it's sort of it, it's half sort of do you yeah, know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, it comes up towards the back of the 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 half, the handle. Yeah. that's true. Yeah, that's the only heli that I really there's there's a folder that I used to really really want as well, and if it sort of fell into my hand, I would take it. But, um, I sort of come at this from the position of I have for my entire bushcraft experience been yearning for a jack lore. But he no longer offers the full-on custom service because it's just too much email. But if I'm going to spend Jack more money, I want to at least be able to tell him what wood to use for the scales. So I'm no longer in the market at some point for a Jack Lord, just because for that kind of money, I'm telling you what I want. Right. And yeah. <clears throat> like Hele sort of gets some of the look and feel to a certain extent of, of the more high end knives without going really into the like the six hundred dollar knife territory. Right. Yeah. Um, I the, the the example I want to give you guys is here. And I've brought these these babies out on screen before. Just bear with me. OK. Hey, Nate, anyone tell me like Ben Affleck. This is the, like the second live stream where someone said that to him. Can't leave him alone, guys. Okay. If, if more more and more people can tell me like that I look like Ben Affleck, I'm gonna be fine with it, and I'll be even more stoked when it actually makes me any kind of like any income, a free beer at the bar or something. Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's my example. Okay. Oh, geez, I just jammed it into the ceiling. Okay. This is a, a Fender Precision yeah, base. I, yeah, they call I it. Hate to break that to you, but that is a that is a what's known as a guitar. It's a bass guitar. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm, yeah. The Fender P bass. They call it's it the Fender bass. The oh, P okay. bass. Okay. I'm sorry. I thought we were talking about knives. I know, but it's. I'm just <laughs> using it as an example. Okay, this Fender P bass is straight up factory built in the United States. Okay, um, it's a classic. This was the first widely available electric bass guitar model in the. Okay, this is a five string. Okay, cost me twelve fifty okay. because there was a, a ding in the paint somewhere. Okay, you can get them anywhere. 
it's a good base too. Yeah, yeah, sure is. I love it. We always had those. So we had the P bases, and then we had uh, the Ibanez Sound Gears. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is a Sadowski. I went to New York City. I chose every piece of wood on it. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Uh, it it's as light as a kitten because the body's chambered. All right. It's a five. Street. You're in the fives. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I only pay five. Play fives. I see. Now the Fender P base was twelve fifty Canadian. The Sadowski was five grand Canadian. But they do the exact same thing. So this is what I was talking about when I get into when you get into more intangibles, like the difference between an affordable canoe and a Swift, or, and an affordable base and a Sadowski, and an affordable knife and a Jack Lore, is that there's a lot of intangibles to the price, right? Because someone somewhere is going to ask, is it worth it, right? And you have to be prepared for that question because there's always a bit of judgment behind that question. And, and if you ask me, is the Sadowski worth it? I have to say no. Okay, in that I'm not getting four and a half times as much performance out of it than I do out of the Fender. I got one word. But the intangibles make it worthwhile, right? Because I, I'm i the only one who owns a base that looks like this, that's exactly like this one. I chose the wood, and it weighs nothing. And the workmanship is so much higher on the Sadowski than on the Fender because it's not they're not pumped off you know, several of them a day off of a production line. It took eight months to get this base, nine yeah. months to get this base because it's one person who does it from stem to stern. That uh, right? one word, one word for you. Sentimentality. Right. Sentimentality. It's it's worth something. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's, it's intangible as hell, but it's worth something. Yeah. It's it's very uh sentimental, and it means yeah. something. That's your guitar. No one has that guitar. That's yours. Yes. So, yeah. You know? And the, and the other thing, the other thing I was going to add to that, if we're if we're at a certain point when it comes to an expert that's using these things, uh, at a certain point it comes to like where where the rubber actually meets the road. So yeah, when absolutely. you're talking about uh, a 35 pound canoe versus a 60 pound canoe. Well, the difference may not be in exactly what a novice feels when they're paddling it on the water, but mm. the difference is going to be when you put it on your head to portage it. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the analogy is there between like a canoe and an axe or a knife, but I'm sure there is one to an expert that is handling knives and axes all day long. Absolutely. And and can tell the difference between what you know what the steel is made of between one knife or another uh, when it comes down to some crucial tasks. Right. Like, <clears throat> well, I think that I think that there are some parallels from canoe to axe to knife to base. Uh, Johnny, I have this. I have it that exact same axe. Um, and it, the fact is, what Johnny is holding up will chop wood. He will have to sharpen it more off, more off that more often than he would if it was a grand's first. But it, it will chop wood, right? I uh, the, had a huge tree. I showed you the stump back there a couple times in uh, other chats with Colin. Yep. I chopped that whole tree down. Like right. <clears throat> you know, uh, a uh, uh, you know a seventy-five pound canoe will get you from one shore to the other. Totally. You know, my Fender bass will. It records beautifully. <laughs> You know, but across the board, like the the exact the exact points do not um, uh, match. Co yeah. Match, yeah. but the overarching theme does. The stuff you're paying for when you go really high end on any of these things <clears throat> are the intangibles. On the fact are the fact that man, I pick up this thirty five pound canoe. And it's like nothing compared to the old canoe I used to have kind of thing. Um, I look at this knife, which was made for me with, you know, the wood that I chose, even though this was very bloody affordable because he was at the beginning of his career. But it's, it's the only one made by him in Canada. Nobody cares except me. That's a beautiful handle, though, too. Yeah. A desert ironwood, man. I've got a thing for it. Desert ironwood and olive wood. That is really, uh, really. You know? 
the fact that it's a beautiful wooden handle doesn't really change anything when I'm, you know, trying to start a fire with it right. in the rain. Yeah. But those intangibles, you know, they're in fact the most expensive part. Yeah. But they're the parts that make us excited about about something, you know? You know, the, the best comparison I could have, I, I suppose, Jesse, is cars. Uh, you know what cars? I mean? Cars? Yeah, you can get a 57 Chevy or a Bel Air, or you can get a muscle car like a Cutlass Supreme, you know, or you can get a Tesla. Mm -hmm. You know, completely different things, but there's a huge spectrum of what you want and what you expect to get out of it. You know what I mean? You and we also now know that Johnny's into classic cars. I am. In <laughs> <clears throat> I am you and my dad could have an amazing <laughs> conversation, let me tell you. I love classic cars, but I'm a truck guy, as you saw. I got my Tacoma and then got my GMC. So yeah. I'm, I'm very utilitarian as well. You know, I like to take my dog in the back and go to the beach, you know? So it, it is what it is. Yeah. If I could, don't get me wrong, if I could have a Bel Air or a Cutlass Supreme, yeah, I could take one in a minute. You know, right. like, like if I drop one on my lap, I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be sad. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. I'm that way about, I would love an electric pickup. I would love a Rivian. I, mean, I don't want to pull this too far away from what we were talking about. Cause I've already sort of changed it into bass guitars, but, <laughs> uh, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's kind of what we're talking about, right? The, you know, the stuff that, that kicks the price into the stratosphere is the most exciting stuff. Yeah. You, you know, know um, that axe. So that axe out in the kitchen, that's the one I use for landscaping and I could dig a hole with it. It's a Fisker. Yep. It, it's a forty dollar axe. It's cheap, and then I got an all American, full steel head with a hickory handle, and it's a beautiful axe, but it's heavier, and I hardly ever use it. You know what I mean? Because I'm <laughs> this thing up, and I'm keeping my other axe in top shape and keeping a perfect edge. And, and you know what I mean? Like so that. And with like, the Fisker, if you ding it on a rock while you're chopping out a root, you kind of don't care. Yeah. I mean, with a higher end axe, you're like, oh man, really? Yeah. Oh no! Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know. It's like, uh, but I just want to ask Nate, what the hell? What do you carry? Are you a Mora carrier? Yeah, Not, I, uh, yeah. I either have a Mora companion that I've been beating on for years, or I have a Mora Garberg. Um, I also about five years ago, um. I bought a really obscure finished stainless steel pin tang knife that I haven't really been able to find too much out about aside from that the price of it has skyrocketed in recent years. And I haven't really used it much because it has a very strange kind of long blade to it. And uh, the, sorry, the back of the blade for want of a better term, uh, doesn't seem to me robust enough to use with a ferro rod. Uh, no. So it sounds like you're uh, you're sitting on a knife that's basically probably made for cleaning birds and small. Because yeah, a lot of yeah, I think so. It's very pretty. It came with it came with a tooled leather sheath with some uh, finishing on the bottom, and and uh, it's it's razor sharp, and it's only razor sharp because I haven't been able to use it for much because. Well, um, yeah, that's not really what I'm using my, my knives for. But, uh, yeah, between, honestly, in my utilitarian kind of ethos of knife use currently, uh, a Mora Companion and a Mora Garberg have been more than sufficient up until now to satisfy everything I'm going out in the bush for and doing. Okay, but let me ask you something then. <clears throat> yeah. Because, I mean, that's kind of the theme, right? What's your favorite knife maker and what makes a knife that you really like? Why did you buy that knife that you can't really use? What was it about that knife that you're like, oh, okay, I want that? Well, it was it was pretty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and that knife, you know what? Okay, so here, I'm going to be honest with you. It was um, when I first started in the job I'm currently at, which gives me access to a lot of really good pricing. Um, and so I think what I, I think what happened is I recognized the craftsmanship in that knife yeah. and the price I could purchase it for. And I okay. put on it because I realized, um, at the time that the price I could pay for it was, uh, very, very good compared to the craftsmanship and value of the knife. 
And okay. now, that I, now that I try to source it out online, I realize I was correct. That's not okay. that I'm going to uh, ye, all of a sudden use that knife more. It's I think it, it's more to your point of like the aesthetics and the intangibles of realizing like the craftsmanship that you have in your hand as part of your tool chest. Yeah, um, absolutely. I do, I do use it. I, I do use it, but it's more in line with almost like a kitchen knife concept Food prep. of a camp knife. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's, it's interesting you mentioned that, Nate, is uh, that can also be another influence on your buy on the other is um, value. You know, yeah. like if it's a deal, you got a sale, okay, and you know, you know it's worth well more than what you're about to pay. That yeah. could help influence you to make the purchase. Yeah, true. Yeah, and, and absolutely, it, it did in this sense, and I'm I'm glad it, that it did because um, I wouldn't be able to purchase this knife again uh, because a I, they're not available in Canada anymore, and b when I when I do kind of look at it, I can see that um, the price the price compared to what I paid for it has gone up. But um, I don't I don't know if you can uh, hang on here. Sorry. I'm, blundering around in my basement <laughs> but you can see it's a it's like a tooled sheath this is cool i want to check it out oh yeah all right and then it's a uh it's stainless steel mm -hmm. so you can see the the blade oh, is it's beautiful yeah it's like oh, a that's... puko yeah, yeah, a curly birch, and then it's got some kind of burnt imagery, like a deer or. No, that's a beautiful knife, man. Yep. Yeah. Wow, cool. But uh, but you can see the blade is like super long, right? Like. Yeah. I've got a, I've got a different kind of K bar it's called a Spider Plus, and it's got the same similar kind of blade. It's almost like a Kitana. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. So I, I want to say hi to uh, today for, uh, from up north of 60. How's it going, mister? Hey, guys. How you doing tonight? How's everyone? Doing great. Doing all right. We're doing okay. Excellent. I'm doing better by the glass. Better, better. <laughs> and I, just... I, I just wanted to say I just, I just started watching the last uh, hot tent video, and I haven't gotten through it yet. But, yeah, it looks, looks awesome up there right now, man. Yeah, cool. Thanks, man. The weather is just like perfect this time of the year. It's like minus 25 in day and about minus 30 at night. So it's really great to get out of the bush this time of the year. I'm glad that sounds perfect to you. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it, it looks amazing. That's for sure. Yeah, you're not doing anything to, uh, to uh, lessen my desire for a hot tent there, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, when it drops down to 40 next month, it's going to be not as fun then. But I think right now is probably my favorite time for sure. Yeah. It's a dry, like it's a nice dry minus 25, right? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it is. No, you know what? It, in all seriousness, like I can I can deal with that. I'm more than happy at minus 25 yeah. or even a little colder if it's a nice dry cold when you've got those uh, damp fronts and, uh, and, and it, you know, Minus thirty and damp out. No, it's yeah. Uh, Nate, I'm with you. Like I was way, way better at minus forty on the prairies than I will ever be at minus forty here in Montreal because there's always a dampness there. There's always like I'm sitting in my basement right now. Earlier today, while I was working, I had a blanket on, and like half of my job is video conferencing. So I've got like this. Hold on, nah, I'm not gonna do it. And I had this blanket on, and I'm video conferencing, and people in the meetings with me are like. Do you have heat? <laughs> and I was like, with respect, shut up. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I get that. I get that. But, yeah. yeah I, um, really, I'm, I'm really interested to hear uh, your take on knives and, uh, and sharpened implemented tools when it comes down to minus 25 and minus 40 next month. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just using, again, just real basic, basic tools. I use a Fiskars X all the time uh, i've been using one for i mean 10 plus years uh i own several of them i've never had an issue with them so they seem to be my my go-to tool uh, my primary belt knife that i carry all the time is my se5 uh that's kind of my jack of all trades and then as 
for my EDC or my pocket knife is just basically a bench made Atomist that's a plain blade with a drop point. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of for my just, you know, daily tasks of just opening things, just using it as a tool. And if I require something with a little bit more oomph to it, then I use the SU5. Now, I got a question about that. <clears throat> um, because I, my knives are four inches. Like that, that's the length I like. I could go a little shorter, maybe a little longer, but once you get to like five inches and up, I'm, I don't like the knife as much because you're sort of getting into the territory where most of the time I just use the ax. And so I'm, I'm interested to know like what, what is a, a driving force behind your choice in like blade length and, and other features to a knife being up where you are? I think for me, you know, keeping in mind that I'm living on the Canadian Shield for the most part. Um, most of the trees up here are rather small, right? So, I mean, we're looking at, like, my island is a little bit of an exception. There's some larger trees on the island, but most <clears throat> of the surrounding areas, you know, trees are probably eight, you know, eight to 12 inches. Um, okay. So they're, so they're, you know, rather small trees. I look at all my tools as more of a utilitarian standpoint where i want to be able to use it <clears throat> for everything so if i'm at my camp and if i want to walk away from my tent or if i'm out into the bush and if i don't want to take my axe off of the skidoo i have my se5 on my hip which is five and a okay. quarter inch blade yeah. <clears throat> um you know it, it weighs 16 ounces or one pound i could easily baton i could easily hack or you know chop a tree down if i needed to if i was collecting birch there's enough weight behind it um I actually, uh, not to throw out a plug for my channel, but um, I actually can use that SE5 as a throwing knife. I've been practicing throwing that for many years. <clears throat> and there's a video on my Instagram where I have a tree and I just pull that thing out of my out of my sheath and throw it just like a tiny little knife. And this one pound knife <laughs> digs in about th maybe three inches into the tree. Wow. Um, so it's something, again, that I've been using for so long that it's just second nature to me. But... I think I look at things is that if I didn't have my ax, I have an SE5 that would get me through what I need. Um, and I kind of layer things up in like a level one, level two, level three. So yep. first is my is my um, Benchmade Atomist, which is which is a heavy duty folder. Second level would be my matched with my SE5, and then a third layer would be with my ax. So that's kind of okay. how I look at things. Yeah. Okay. That's a great denomination, actually. You mentioned it like that. Yeah, like yeah. each tool kind of adds to the next level. So that just, you know, like my axe, my knife, and my pocket knife collectively would greatly improve my chances of survival if I needed it. Whereas if I just have my SE and my pocket knife, then, you know, they have their own capabilities. So everything is kind of paired up with each other in a so, system. Uh, sorry, can I just interject with a quick question here? EDC, what what is the length of that blade that you're carrying on you at all times? <clears throat> um, it's a good question. I'll look at the actual specifications. I, I think it's maybe about three and a half inches. Let me okay. double check. Okay. All right. That's so, yeah, no, nothing. Uh, yeah, like nothing. Yeah, like we're not talking like Morris Kohansky kind of like five inches or nothing less kind of feeling. No, no. Like three and a half, four inches. Yeah, that's uh goes back to what Jesse said. Mine are about three and a half. Three and a half. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, you know, my folding knife is about three. Three, yeah, yeah. It's just it's curious because I, um, there seems to be like um, not a breaking point, but just like this point where there's kind of like a, a comfort level in modern society over what you can carry in your pocket or on your hip twenty four hours a day, hmm. um, and what will do the trick for for what you want to do uh versus like what you're actually going to go into the bush and use if you're out into the out in the and you know it's interesting hearing from up north of 60 of course because that's where he's spending most of most of his time so yep. it's kind of cool to see that someone that's doing that is using that like three and a half four inch and not like uh like a five inch and nothing smaller kind of thing right yeah, yeah. Nate. Um, I suppose it's like goes along with that same right tool for the right job. Also, how it applies to your environment and what you're going to do. If you're not yeah. fishing, you're not going to need a fish knife. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that thing. Yeah. The, the thing that I like about that bench made is that it's a hard use knife. So it's a, it's a, it's a little bit more robust than let's say, you know, like a Spyderco. 
Yeah. Um, I'm looking at it here. So it's, so the blade length is uh 3.82 inches. Nice. Cool. Um, and when you hold on to the knife, I mean, it like it has some weight to it. It uh, weighs 7.6 ounces. So it's, um, that's about a half pound, about a half pound. Yeah. And the back I don't know of what any of that means. Uh, eight ounces is a half pound. There's 16 ounces in a pound. So my SE five is basically twice as heavy as my, as my folder Okay. or my folder is about half as heavy. But, um, the thing I like about the folder is that the spine on it is, uh, at a, at a 90 degree edge. So I actually use the back of that knife with my fire steel. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, I just want to ask, uh, Tenenbaum has a question for Nate. Is that, is that uh, Puko of yours a martini? Um, I replied and said that it is no, it is a beer. <laughs> I thought he meant. I thought he meant. Oh, another. God. A, Sorry. No. Okay. I, I, yeah, okay. I, I will read it. I will read it off the blade. It says it is uh, an Asaki Yarvina, uh, stainless Finland. Huh. Okay. Uh, so I I S A K K I, and then um, Y, or I guess in this case it would be a J. A R V E N N A A. Man, that finish, man. It's all double letters all it's the time. Double, double letters and a and a J that's actually a Y and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, that's yeah. what it that's what it says on the sorry for the uh I mean it, that thing is in mint condition. And it, it it's it's funny to me that like um, that knife reminds me, it's funny whenever you look at, um, like Lapland, right? The laps, yeah. that's what they carry, right? That's a robust knife for Lapland. You shoot oh, okay. over so, to like the so, Northwest territories or something. So Jesse, that brings me to my next question as someone that's been delving into a lot of like, you know, bushcraft podcasts and books and things like that. So, and you're talking about all these, you know, Scandinavians that are so, expert at this kind of like forest living and in bushcraft uh, lifestyle and so really what is everyone's take on the difference and the, the necessity between a pin tang which is what this is and uh and a full tank i think that there, one of the reasons i like a full tang is because i just got marketed to successfully do you know yeah. what i'm saying yeah um i uh, and but i have a feeling that i like a full tang because i on occasion not with a canadian belt knife but i will occasionally uh baton with my knife and i have this weird idea that that the full tang creates strength at the join between the scales or the handle and and the blade and so I'm not afraid of snapping my knife. And this is fed by the fact that there was a British channel that I was I used to watch a lot, and uh, they were uh, they were going to do the guy was going to do a review of um, not a Mora, but we were talking about uh, a Hella, one of their sort of rat tail tangs or pin tang knives. And he said, you know, I'd like to do a review of this, but I've broken it, <laughs> right? And the handle was snapped all the way off. And so ever since that sort of like I had this, you know, I've got this image of this guy holding these two pieces of the knife up and saying, man, I broke it. <laughs> and I wasn't even doing anything too bad with it, man. And so to me, that sort of it. Like, I will admit that there might be um, like confirmation bias in my approach. Right. Uh, you know, um if Ray Mears says you need a full tang knife, then by God, I'm going to have a full tang knife. And then, oh, see, see, it broke. See, it broke. But I, you know, it, I don't know if, like, I've got Mora's and I haven't broken them. I, uh, do you know what I'm let saying? Me ask, let me ask you a question, Jesse, just to add to that. If, if you were using a knife in a survival situation, which, which would you choose, a full tang or the pin tang? Ah, uh, that's, there's the, that's, this is the question I wanted to get. Yeah. At. In a survival situation, I would feel much more comfortable with a full tank just because to me, I know that it's not going to snap off. Whereas with the pin, with that, that, with the pin tank at the back of my mind, what if it not breaks? Not so much. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, uh, I really like, I like full tank, but you know, 
polish the kitchen knives, you know, and I just, I love it. I just love the way it feels in my hand and I got more control. I'm glad you said that because, because I had forgotten to bring that up, but it's a Mora. It's the Mora blade shape. It's a full tank. It doesn't feel like any other Mora I own, really? right? There's so much weight happening right here that you don't get with the other Moras. Um, so that when I first got this and broke it, I was like, I'm going to do some bushcraft. It felt really weird. I had to kind of take a half hour to get used to it because to me, Mora, all the way it's on the blade, right? Yeah. Um, but it's such, it's such a beautifully balanced knife. You got a good fulcrum going by the way uh, you're holding it right now. I can tell it's got a great fulcrum. It's, 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 it's a, it's a beautiful and it, 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 it threw me because to me, Moras, they're heavier in the blade. Operate thusly. I, and so I love, I, I love my companion and I even love my Eldris because they're light. You, you know, you can wear them, you can yep. wear them on your belt and it barely feels like anything. And the Eldris, you can wear them on your neck and you can barely feel it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, my Garberg, when I first got it, I was like, Oh yeah, this is basically like owning a very small axe. Like I can take this thing to town because I baton. Yeah. All of my it's work. a whole different. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, I absolutely love it. If there was going to be out of the out of any knife I own, including the ones that are hanging out in the kitchen, yeah. Um, it, if it was going to be one knife that I was going to be stuck out in the bush with, it was. It's going to be that Garberg, um, because yeah, yeah. That, that thing is extremely robust and. And the way I the way I always think of like something like a full tang is that should should the handle for some reason disintegrate or break on you because you have a full tang knife, you can if you're halfway handy, manufacture or you know bushcraft yourself uh, a function a functional handle for that full tang knife to then keep on using it as per its intended uh, usage. You know what yeah. I mean? Or at the end of the day, you've still got a handle. Right. It's not going to be comfortable, but you've still got the leverage, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. You also, you can wrap it in paracord if you have to. Yeah. 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 You know? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and I also, like, I got to the point with my companion where I was starting to do some wood processing where I was, like, really, like, eyeing up, like, Am I going to, is this something going to happen and I'm going to hurt my fingers right now? Mm. And, um, and with the Garberg, I just don't get that. Like I have no, I have, I have no fear. I have no compunctions about yeah. trying different stuff in terms of wood processing with that, that I would with, you know, a knife that's a half tang or a pin tang or a rat tang or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. You're a... Uh... Your confidence level with uh, the knife you're handling too can really dictate what you can get done with it. I That's actually, it. yeah. Uh, you know, what oh, I was talking about before about intangibles and all that. Boom. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, when, when you're like up north, because that SE5, that's a full tang. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, um, and, you know, on the regular, you're in the kind of territory that I get to sometimes do you know what i'm saying like yeah, when i'm having a fantastic month i get to that kind of territory and even then i don't i don't get north you know but i like I, i'll hit the boreal on occasion um but like yeah. it's you know you live where it is really really cold and i feel that if you make some of the mistakes that i make on the regular it could get really <laughs> bad for you and so i, I could see that you know, the, the tools you would, the tool, if I lived where you live, my tool selection would be on the robust side rather than the fancy wood side. Yeah. That's kind of my methodology when I, yeah. when I purchase my equipment is I ask myself, would I, would I use this to survive and to wage in my life on? And if I say no, then I won't carry it with me. So I carry the SE5 because that's the knife that I would, you know, want as my, one and only knife in a survival situation. I carry my Benchmade Atomist because that's the one and only folder I would want in a survival right. situation. So that becomes my new norm. So I become proficient with using those more robust, not as sleek, high-speed tools. 
Right. Uh, and then that becomes my new norm. So when I'm in that situation, it's just, it's just a regular tool for me to use. And how long have you had those, those knives? I've been carrying my SC, I bought my SC5 in 2012, so eight years. Okay. And right. I bought my, um, my Atomus, I think maybe 2011. And it's and the same, so, blade, same one. Same, really? the exact same one. If I showed you, um, or even if you just check on, I think maybe the last video I posted, you'll see me use it in my video and you can see how worn it is. Like the paint is literally worn off because I carry that thing in my pocket every day, 365 days of the year. So the, so the, so the side of my, um, uh, G 10 handle that actually like touches against my leg is worn more than, than, uh, than the outer okay. handle because that, you know, doesn't have any friction on it. Okay, and so I'll ask all of you. I'll start with 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 you, Dave. Um, if you lost that Atomus or that SC five, you'd buy the exact same thing again without even thinking twice. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Nate? Uh, I had another. Uh, sorry, I had another question. Are those, okay. Are those tools uh, stainless? Uh, no, my um, my. Uh... Benchmade is, I think about that for a second. It's a G2. And my uh, SE is uh, 1095 carbon steel. What uh, kind of upkeep in your, in your environment up there, what kind of upkeep are you having to do on those on a, on what kind of basis? Um, for my SE5, uh, I mean, I'm in a low moisture area for the most part, so I'm not really worried about rusting on the, um, on the 1095 it has a real nice powder coat on there so it seems to protect the knife but i mean just touch up the blade maybe every two or three weeks i just usually strop my blade on my se5 um and then just add some some oil to it usually i'll use like a coconut oil like a cooking oil on it because like i'll use that knife sometimes for actually like processing meat so i don't want to yeah like an that's, actual oil yeah and that's why i use mineral oil on my blades I yeah. never know when something's going to end up being used. A for kitchen duty. If I forgot my uh, my um, my white, my whatever is my mini Nesmuk, or uh, carving a spoon. Yeah, you know, spoon goes in the mouth, right? It always down. Mm -hmm. I hear they're using a uh, walrus oil now a lot for the stuff that's culinary safe for um, hand carved spoons and also for their blades. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, walrus oil. And then for the uh, Benchmade, that's a uh, that's a D2 steel, so it's a tool steel. It uh, it's a very hard steel. It's a, actually a bit of a pain in the ass to sharpen. <laughs> um, and uh, for the most part, I mean, the blade on that is pretty rough right now. Like I I should actually send it back to Benchmade. They have a great warranty program where you can send it back for a blade replacement. I think for like thirty bucks. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. They really so do. I'll, I'll end up doing that at some point in time because my blade is in serious need of replacement. Interesting. <clears throat> so Nate, if you um I know that if you lost that Leatherman you would try to source the exact same one again, right? Yeah, probably would be the the wingman or the sidekick, one or the other. Uh, <clears throat> between the wingman and the sidekick, I believe is saw versus scissors and yeah. it would probably be saw. Yeah. Now actually that's an interesting question because both of those are very useful. I find that the Leatherman scissors are a little small. They're more like emergency scissors than anything else. But the saw is kind of the same, right? Um, but the saw in my Leatherman, the spine on that thing was excellent for a ferro rod. Yeah. And I think that's what, why I would keep continuing the, the saw option. Um, yeah, as far as my kind of bushcraft out in the, out in the, out in the forest for or, or uh, canoe tripping, um, it would definitely be the carb again and again. And don't get me wrong. I, I think it's out of, out of ignorance for anything I've been able to otherwise get my hands on in terms of hand feel. Um, we do sell Hele. And I love the tomogamy. Like, I love the feel yeah. of tomogamy. But it's almost to me because I feel like I'm um, at a bit of a hack stage where I feel like the Garber gives more value to me because I don't have to, I don't have to think about it twice if I'm going to abuse it, trying something. Right. Uh, whereas the tomogamy is definitely, you know, you look at it as a work of craftsmanship, but it's also a very nice tool. Yeah. Um, 
Whereas the Garber guy can look at it a bit uh, more of like a, this is a tool. I'm going to feed on it and I'm going to try stuff that I haven't tried before to, you know. Yeah. And anyway, it's, it's, my skills. it's funny that you bring up the, the, the tomography because um, I've been dying for one for years, but they're just, it's funny. I keep saying I'll, I'll get it next year, but the price has been going up. Uh, right the first time i said oh i love that but not this year it was 150 dollars 160 bucks right at uh, canadian outdoor equipment company it ain't that no more no you know <laughs> yeah. uh, and so it's like i keep feeling that i've lost i've missed the boat and i'm gonna miss the boat again this year and next year it's just gonna get more expensive but like i i'm a carbon steel guy and yet Two of the fav the three favorite knives on this desk right now are stainless. <laughs> so now I'm not like if I ever like won the lottery and I could miraculously afford the tamagami, which would I get? Like, am I still sort of stuck in the in the well? Car no, no, carbon steel. Like in my head, carbon steel is the way to go. Carbon steel is the way to go. Or do I sort of? Uh, it's not going to make it any easier on you, Jess. But the tamagami is available in triple laminate stainless or carbon. I know, I know. That's the thing, right? And it's like, <sighs> do you know? For uh, yeah, for me, because um, I'm I'm not a, oh, you know, for me because I'm not kind of like a a tool oriented person like some other bushcraft enthusiasts are. Uh, for me, stainless is just a more appealing option. Because it's it's less maintenance, it's less to think about. It's it's less mental burden when I think about my tool set, right? Even yeah, even because when I, I get home, I, I fully you know I fully I'm cognizant of the of the you know the the merits of carbon steel. I I know I know. When 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 I get home from the bush, or let's face it, from working with wood in my backyard these days, <laughs> um all my tools get washed and oiled. Like it's just, it's part of, you have to. Yeah, you have to. And, but I used to, I, I sort of talked about this in a previous live stream, uh, but I'm boring enough to just repeat it. Um, I used to really hate that phase. Like the, Oh, unpacking. Oh, nope. uh, but I, now I, I sort of switched to it's part of the trip rather than it's God, I'm home from the trip and let down on. Oh, I have to do all this maintenance. It's part of the bushcraft. It is. So now I just, I, 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 I Zen out, go to the sink, wash my stuff, clean it off, dry it off, oil it up. Um, but if I had a whole bunch of stainless stuff, I wouldn't have to do that. I, I'd be interested to hear what North of 60, who I, I would kind of assume is doing this much more regularly his take on stainless versus carbon. Yeah, I don't uh, have any tools that I use that are stainless. Um, the only one I have would be, I do have a Mora bushcraft knife. Um, I don't carry it with me very often, but uh, like, again, it's kind of like Jesse said, it's just as I come home, it there's a certain process of like bringing your tools in, bringing my gun in, I clean my gun, I clean my, sorry, Jesse, didn't mean to say that word in your channel. <laughs> Damn it, sir. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and then I just clean my knives and, you know, clean my gear. So there's just a routine that I have now. Um, but again, I find because I live in a very low moisture environment, things are quite dry up here. Uh, there's no salt that, that is just really low maintenance on that knife I have. Yeah. I live in a very high, um, I was about to say moisture content. Shut up, Jesse. Uh, I live in a very high, uh, humidity environment. Montreal is very humid winter, summer, Forget about it. It's humid all the time. And so, like, for me, and I, Nate, what's it like around where you live, humidity-wise? Um, it's fairly low moisture. Um, I don't know. I think we have a bit more of, like, a temperate, like, um, you know, we have a bit more of a seasonal humidity and then a seasonal dryness aside from, like, a more kind of year-round steadiness. Yeah, um, yeah. In the winter, it's very, very dry, and in the spring, and at some points in the summer and, and early fall, it's very, very humid. Um, okay, because yeah. like uh, here, winter is very dry when it's minus forty, but when it's like minus twenty or like 
I don't even really know what what the exact temperature would be, but a lot of winter is sort of a a, a wet cold, right? Oh, um, and summer, right. man, is is one of the Montreal. Oh God, the reason why everyone is dressed so skimpily in downtown Montreal all summer is because we're all freaking dying. It's that kind of city where at night you lie down in your bed and you stick to the sheets and you sort of peel off the one sheet and it's you know and so with the tools that i use even though i'm a carbon steel guy this thing is so easy to care for because it's stainless right like i'm not worried about the rust all the time the way i'm with my axes or with my my carbon you know with this guy Jeez, I almost spilled the, the scotch. With this guy, right? That's a carbon steel blade. You know, I wash it. I dry it. I knock the scotch over. I, you know, I oil everything because I like to oil my wood as well, right? Yeah. I, I, I oil the whole damn thing up. Everything. You know, with, with this, the, uh, the stainless knives, I don't have to be quite so... But as I said, it, it's not as bad as it used to be. This man, it used to bug me. I'd be like, oh, I don't want to do this, you know. No. But I've come around to it. You know, Jesse, uh, like that meticulousness of caring for your tools is part of what we do on a daily basis in any kitchen place. Like, yeah, we should, like a ritual. We all line up our stones at the end of each night and sharpen our knives. Yeah. I myself, I prefer carbon over the stainless at certain applications. So, like, yeah. we go back to the whole um, right tool for the job thing. Is uh, yep. is the the carbon steel is easier to keep an edge on, yep. and it, it does a great job. It tarnishes a little bit with this beautiful patine that looks natural, and um, you know, it'll hold an edge pretty well. But it's uh, its longevity is not up to stainless. That blade, right. carbon steel blade, on a regular, every time you use it. That thing starts to wear down. It goes away. Yep. It's erosive. You know what I mean? So, and in the stainless steels, they're great, but they take longer to sharpen, and they'll do a little bit more wear on your stone that you're using. So, yeah, it's it's a give and take. And I I gauge it by how am I going to use the knife? What am I going to use it for? What am I going to around? Because like uh, up north said, he's got low salt content. I got a hygrometer in my kitchen. It's yep. eight it's 87 percent humidity here on an average off my high and there's a high salt level because i'm i'm at sea level yeah and that's salt in the air so a carbon steel knife it's gonna suffer a little bit more than a stainless will yep yeah so i'll use a stainless when i when i want to really get in the in the junk and go salty and you know have it in the ocean and toss a kayak or a, a canoe or whatever i'm in or boat yep. but for the car I mean, I'll choose the carbon for general application and just to keep it razor. I could keep that thing so razor sharp, I could shave with it. Right. Like, you know? But, yeah, I get that. I definitely get that. <clears throat> and, I mean, you know, you use knives as, you know, to pay the rent, right? So Yeah. Oh, it's my livelihood. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, at one point, Johnny, you and I have to have a, a private one-on-one -on -one to just geek out over kitchen knives because I there is stuff that I want but I'm not ready to buy yet. Um, knives, stones, the whole kit and caboodle. Yeah, these are uh, my axe, Jesse, that I take to work. And I, uh, I, carry, I carry more gear to work than anyone else I work with, and I get a lot of flack for that. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, man. They give me a lot of help for it. They're like, yeah, man, you got like you brought your own kitchen to work today, John? I'm like, I always do because – I want to be able to access my tools for when I do special projects or I'm running a special set or I'm doing something. I can't count on anyone else to go and have what I need, you know? Yeah, I get it. And no, I get it. I know that I'm going to be doing a 15 hour shift when I clock in. I'm not Where do you there work? to leave. I can't leave. I'm there. I'm stuck there for 15 hours. I want to be comfortable. Right. Oh, I have everything that I need. Uh, Johnny, uh, Hawaii Volcano Squad is asking where you work. Oh, I work for Sansa. For who? Fonse? David Kodama? I'm sorry, this sounds Canadian. I don't know what it is. Oh, um, Sanse. It, you got one. At, a DK Steakhouse, and then we got a Sanse at Oahu, right where you live in Waikiki. And uh, I work for the one on Maui. 
Wait, wait. Is sansei the way you pronounce sensei? Uh, like no. teacher in Japanese? No, sansei uh, is spelt different. Huh. And uh, it's not an A, it's an E. And what it means in Japanese is next generation. So you work okay. at a, a, a Japanese restaurant, is what you're saying? I'm a sushi chef. Awesome. Yeah. So I've been a sushi chef, I think, running. Before I went with them, I was a head sushi chef at a place called Threes in Kihei Town. And then before that, um, I was uh, at Morimoto. I opened Morimoto and worked for him. I would like to point out that two-thirds of the uh, Hawaiians who hang out at my channel are on screen right now. <laughs> That's awesome. And <laughs> Nate took off, so I got to say goodnight to Nate. And, and I wanted to thank him for hanging out, man. He had some really useful information. He always does. He always yeah. does, man. If that guy shows up on, on screen, it's like, oh, this is going to be a good live stream. So cool, man. That knife. Thanks for sharing that knife. It's beautiful. Oh, yeah. So awesome. <laughs> Oh, you know what, guys? We're at 2300 um, or whatever, 11 p.m. So we're done. Cool. Um, man, I could have gone for longer, but, you know. Well, I just got here, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right? Uh, so I want to thank everyone who hung out in the chat on the side. I know I didn't really get to interact with you guys that much, um, but I've been reading and trying to sort of fit into the conversation to answer. Uh, everyone who came on uh, screen, thanks for coming in being interesting um hawaii volcano squad i think you probably had something interesting to say we'll we'll try to get you on a little earlier next time um so to everyone who is out there hanging leaving comments i, I was digging a trench during your your yes i i <laughs> i was gonna i was trying to figure out how to get that into the conversation but um everyone stay healthy Stay safe and stay sane. Thanks for hanging out with us. Good night, yeah. guys. Aloha, guys. Good night. Aloha.